Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's online event hosted by the International Inequalities Institute. My name is Kirsten Seinbruch, and I am a British Academy Global Professor and a Distinguished Policy Fellow at the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. I am incredibly pleased to be chairing today's event entitled Technological Change, Cities and Spatial Inequality. Technological change is reshaping economic geography, raising profound challenges for economic development. The tech sector is concentrated in a small number of superstar cities, while the economies of less successful cities are languishing in middle income traps. This raises significant questions and challenges for policy. How do we spread the benefits of the high-tech economy without diluting its benefits? How can we ensure low-wage worker benefit from the innovation economy? The panelists discussing these questions today will be Professor Simona Yamarino, Dr. Tom Kemeny, and Dr. Megan Newcomb. Professor Simona Yamarino is a professor of economic geography at the LSE and an editor of the Journal of Economic Geography. Dr. Com Tom Kemeny is a visiting fellow at the LSE, III, and an associate professor in economic development in the School of Business and Management at Queen Mary, University of London. And Dr. Me Mega Mukim is a senior economist and team leader for competitive cities at the World Bank and author of their flagship report, Competitive Cities for Jobs and Growth. Just for your information, this event will run around um, for, for an hour and a half from 1, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m. And our speakers will present first for about an hour. And then as usual, there will be the chance to ask questions and the chance for discussion afterwards. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens to ask your questions and state your name and university or affiliation if that's possible. And just to uh, let you know, the next public event to be held at the International Inequalities Institute is entitled Taxation History, Theory, Law and Administration. And it will take place at 1 p.m. on Monday, the 8th of November. So please go to the III website for more information on this. And now I'm going to hand you over to our speakers, beginning with Dr. Newcomb. Great. Um, thank you, Kirsten and LSE International Inequalities Institute um, for your invitation. Your, your current director is one of the World Bank's alumni superstar chief economist. And so it's really very nice to interact with his new family and of course my alma mater, the LSE. Uh, although my research days are not quite behind me as the only person on the panel who's outside of academia, I assume that my task is to bring to this chat a flavor of how research is interacting with policy. So I'll talk a little bit about how the World Bank is thinking about spatial issues, how this links to technological changes for different types of our clients, um, especially some of the poorest countries and cities, and then finally how we see this work evolving. I've organized my thoughts for this um, talk in two parts how technology has the potential to disrupt urban development, and then in turn, how cities can deploy disruptive technology for development, or what the bank likes to call inclusive development. So let's start with a couple of stylized facts. Um, economic activity is highly concentrated. That's because cities have many advantages. They allow workers to be closer to jobs, increase opportunities, fuel productivity, they bring people together physically, they facilitate the exchange of ideas, they bring about innovations. Second, economic activity increases with density. So even in the poorest countries, industry and services tend to be concentrated in dense metropolitan areas and productivity rises with the density of economic activity. At the World Bank, recent research by my colleagues, uh, Arti Grover, Sean McLall, and Bill Maloney, um, shows that nightlight intensity, which is a proxy for economic activity, is on average 2.5 times higher in cities with more than 5 million people compared with cities with um, populations below a million. And last week, we know that countries with lower capacity have seen one of the fastest rates of urbanization. Cities in Africa and Asia are dense. They lack public space and they lack livability. 
and inadequate planning has meant that fewer people have access to jobs. Um, as an example, in Nairobi, around 42% of the population walks to work. And so they can only access about 11% of the jobs in the city, assuming that they walk for 60 minutes. In comparison, in London, a resident can reach about 54% of all the jobs in the city within 45 minutes uh, using public transit. New digital technologies are fundamentally changing um, the world of work and of cities. And they do this via three different ways, uh, automation, connectivity, and innovation, or what Richard Baldwin likes to call globotics, uh, which is a combination of automation and globalization. Uh, and what the digital technologies do is they're, they're changing the cost of labor versus that of capital, the cost of transacting, the potential for the economies of scale and market competition, and of course, the speed of innovation. And together, that determines how and where goods are produced and services provided, and thus what the world of work is going to look like both in developing and uh, developed countries. So what does this mean for developed countries? Well, these changes are affecting white collar service sectors, um, office jobs in developed countries that were previously sheltered from developing country competition. Why? Because remote intelligence, or again, what Baldwin calls telemigration, um, developing countries can directly export lower end white collar work, uh, for instance, data entry or assembly tasks, in which they have a comparative advantage due to lower, uh, lower labor costs. And that allows developed country firms to tap into the human cloud that is provided by developing country labor. What does that mean for developing countries? Um, new digital technologies could be creating an upheaval in office work in developed countries, but they do have the potential to be uplifting for developing countries. Um, the export industries of the future in these countries is going to be driven by cities, services, and training, rather than factories, equipment, and technologies. But who is going to benefit in developing countries? It certainly seems that these trends may not benefit the very poorest countries. Rather, it's people and countries that are most likely to benefit are going to be middle-class people in middle-class countries. And that's because the ability to benefit from these changes requires three things. Um, workers that have skills that are recognized internationally, which requires secondary education at the very least, a steady electricity supply, and internet connectivity. And as seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, too often those who are best able to benefit from workplace disrupting technologies are usually the most highly educated and skilled. And likewise, the benefits will be localized within countries because of the need for a thick local labor market that consists of workers with the necessary education levels and skills. Bangalore is a, is a classic example of that. But we know that there exists a digital divide between advanced and emerging economies because the latter lack what the 2016 World Development Report on Digital Dividends calls analog complements, um, limited access to technology, a lack of skills, and the absence of a broad enabling environment. And not surprisingly, the better educated, the well-connected, and the more capable have received most of the benefits. And so new digital technologies bring the risk of new inequities, some of which are already being seen between the big tech creators of the technologies and the users, between the more skilled and the less skilled in developing country cities, between cities and places that possess the necessary enabling environment to leverage the technology and those that don't. Now COVID-19 has supercharged the effects of digital technologies. And most interestingly for economic geographers, it has revitalized the death of distance debate. Um, I, I don't know if some of you remember that debate from 20 years ago, that was when communication technologies had exploded. According to recent articles by the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Washington Post, talent in the United States, millions of workers are scrambling for the exit away from large crowded and expensive cities. However, many economists think that the current exodus of talent amounts to a temporary blip. In fact, most of the migration in the United States represents people who are moving from city centers to suburbs, a change that is made possible by hybrid work and less commuting. Um, survey data that was presented at a recent session of um, you know, Henry Overman's What Work Center points to similar trends in the United Kingdom. Matt Kahn, who is a professor uh, at Johns Hopkins, has a recent paper that shows that the pandemic shrank the premium that people are willing to pay to live in the center of cities compared to the suburbs. And he posits that those who will leave these cities will probably cluster again anyway, but someplace else, perhaps cities that have better amenities. 
So the new technologies will probably not mean the death of cities in developed or in developing countries. Indeed, there's a potential it might be quite the opposite. You might have new technologies that can't replace human interaction, and therefore those work tasks that depend on such interaction, the jobs of the future will be more local and subject to agglomeration. Uh, cities are also not just centers of work, but they're, of, they're there for consumption and people are tied to places because of greater possibilities for social interaction. Uh, and in developing countries in particular, the labor market pooling that cities promote will help to concentrate telemigration work. So the second part, what can cities do to use disruptive technology? Um, I apologize if you can hear thunderstorms in the background. We're having quite a few in Johannesburg right now. Um, anyway, I'll, I'm going to organize my thoughts along three lines, um, efficiency, inclusion, and innovation, and I'll try and give you a, a flavor of some of the examples of the work that we're doing. So efficiency, um, to do more with less. By collecting large amounts of data and then translating that data into insights, cities can boost efficiency of their operations. The data helps cities much uh, better match the supply of public services with real time needs and uncover emerging problems before they turn into crisis. Digital technologies make this possible in several ways. They can use data from cameras, sensors, and anonymized cell phone records into intelligence, uh, for example, to help optimize traffic flows in real time. Predictive analytics uh, can be used to track and predict everything from rainfall to crime and possible landslide areas. Um, in the example on the slide, the World Bank has partnered with DLR, um, the German Space Agency, to get three-dimensional data for cities. And we use this data, especially on building heights, to estimate available floor space per person, which allows you to distinguish between density and overcrowding, and then identifying areas where people will be unable to follow social distancing. And then we combine that with data on proximity to basic service points, uh, where people might cluster even in lockdowns, for instance, to predict COVID-19 contagion risk hotspots for 53 cities across different regions. Um, and uh, you have an example of Kinshasa in the DRC, uh, where the contagion risk hotspots covered a large portion of the city and accounted for almost 6 million residents that were at risk. The second is innovation um, at, uh, through collaboration at city scale. So open data, social media, and cell phones enable governments, firms, and citizens to exchange vast amounts of uh, vast amounts of information at virtually no cost, and they also enable real-time uh, collaboration. For our work, we've been integrating different kinds of data that's available, um, data that's looking down from the sky, like remote sensing drone data, as well as data that's looking up from Earth, uh, like locally collected data. And so the example here on the slide is when we partnered with OpenStreetMap communities for our work. And then the last one is inclusion uh, to ensure that everyone benefits. Um, a third of the world's urban population lives in slums or informal settlements. Um, we partnered with Slum Dwellers International in several cities um, to have local data sets on intra-city poverty and vulnerability that was collected through field and digital surveys, community mapping, or using innovative digital tools like mapillary, drone imageries, and so on. Uh, and that obviously makes for much more granular data for much more contextually relevant analysis. So these are just a couple of examples of what the bank is doing in the realm of data partnerships and technical assistance. In the urban space, we're the largest multilateral development bank. We have a portfolio of about 25 billion uh, in urban alone, and we commit approximately 5 billion in new funding annually. And then finally, I wanted to make a pitch for the World Bank Group's next sustainable development flagship report. Um, my colleague Mark Roberts and I are going to be leading this report, which explores the interaction between cities and climate change and the mechanisms via which they are linked. Um, we know that predicting the post-pandemic world is a bit like reading tea leaves. The future is always going to be uncertain, um, yet it seems clear that cities will grow and that climate will change and that technology is going to be an important response to that challenge as, as well. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a beautiful summer afternoon here in Johannesburg, even with the thunderstorms. And I would really have loved to be in London and meet everyone in person for this. Nonetheless, it's been a real pleasure to be invited and I, and I look forward to the discussion. Um, I also just wanna say a special thank you to the sign language interpreters 
Um, I'm actually learning ASL myself, unfortunately not BSL, but thank you very much to you in ASL. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Megan. Now we move on to Tom. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, all right, let me get my PowerPoint started here. <clears throat> Okay, I'm hoping you can see my PowerPoint and Kirsten, if you can't, please let me know. <clears throat> so uh, let me start by saying i um, very happy to be here uh, with you and I'm honored to be uh, included in this panel of distinguished speakers. Um, so as you can see from the title here, uh, I'm going to be focusing on the US and, and while Mega was, I would say, rather looking forward, um, I'm going to be looking backwards. Um, thinking about what we can learn from long run evidence. Oops. Okay. So I, I think we can agree on this panel um, that there is a growing awareness and a growing sense that spatial inequality is a real problem. And I think part of the reason why this consensus is emerging is there's growing evidence to say that once, even after we account for compositional differences uh, among people in places, we can see that uh, being from a disadvantaged place is associated with all sorts of disparities around economic opportunity for yourself, uh, for your children, uh, disparities in health, uh, racial inequality, and, and really a wide range of problems that uh, that we all care about. And this, certainly this is true in the United States, but also in a wide range of countries um, as well. <clears throat> um, in the United States, much of the conversation around spatial inequality is focused on the period starting around 1980. Uh, this is when the, the, sort, the so-called great divergence is said to begin. Um, and so here's some uh, data plotting that rise <clears throat> excuse me, that rise of spatial inequality. Uh, we're looking here at Gini coefficients for commuting zones. Commuting zones are essentially local labor markets. So we're splitting up the lower 48 states of the US into contiguous local labor markets. And we can see in a bunch of different ways that we might measure incomes, um, annual wages, total income, individual level, uh, household measures, um, deflating use a, using a national CPI, but also deflating using local differences in living costs, we see this steady rise in, <clears throat> excuse me, in income inequality in space in the United States. Now, of course, if we think spatial inequality is a problem, and we know that it's rising, uh, in order to think about how we might fix it, we need to think about what the causes are. And in the US, there is fairly widespread agreement that approximate cause, at least, is what we might call uh, skill-biased agglomeration economies. And so this comes from the observation that we have an emergent set of populous, high productivity, and high cost cities. Uh, Kirsten referred to them as superstar cities at the beginning that are very dense in college educated workers that college educated workers have sorted into these cities and concentrated and with that has come spatial inequality um why are they there well a lot of the reason seems to be or at least consensus around the reason seems to be that they are gathered there to benefit from sharing information with one another uh and from benefits of labor pooling having lots of firms and workers and opportunity <clears throat> and behind that, the sort of idea that a set of industries have concentrated in these superstar cities. And even behind that, at least in some accounts, is a story about uh, computers and technology that have, uh, that have shifted the dynamics. Now, I want to argue that there's a couple of big things missing in this story. Uh, one of those big things is really about the role of technology, meaning that in these accounts of these superstar cities, uh, computers and the digital revolution, it, these sorts of technologies are inferred, but most of the empirical work is really narrowly focused on the labor market. And it's simply just assumed that changes that we might observe in the labor market are a function of technological changes, but we don't know exactly, well, what, what kinds of technological changes, what sorts of innovation? And moreover, who exactly do these technologies act upon? Uh, we know that there are big wage differences even within people who hold college degrees. And so there's the suggestion here that 
Well, just having a college degree is a pretty crude indicator of the kinds of skills that might matter. Moreover, there's the question of, well, why exactly are they all bound together? Uh, so there's a set of questions, I think, around the role of technology that, that's underexplored. <clears throat> Um, a second big thing missing in this sort of account is a certain ahistoricity, meaning that much of the work is focused on this 1980 and beyond period. Um, but we know that there, of course, is history before 1980. And so it raises all sorts of questions about, well, what can we learn if we think about that longer run process? If technology is the deep driver, well, what was happening around technology in the pre-1980 period that might enable what uh, historians call the great leveling, a sort of a compression of incomes at both the interpersonal level and at the geographical level. Um, and so my collaborators and I are trying to chase down these missing pieces. Uh, and when I say collaborators here, I want to give a shout out to uh, Michael Storper at LSE and UCLA, um, who's been working with me on some of this, on really uh, much of the, the work that I'm going to be talking about, as well as Sergio Petralia at the University of Utrecht and um, <clears throat> from Arizona State University, Dylan Connor. Um, so one of the ways into this is really to try and zoom out and get a bigger picture of the patterns of spatial inequality in the United States over the much longer run. Um, so as I mentioned, much of the work is focused on the post 1980 period. So here on the screen, that's the sort of red line that we can see rising up indicating uh, growing spatial inequality. When we try and get a picture that goes much further back in time, and so this one starts in 1900, um, <clears throat> We see, on the one hand, uh, the great compression that historians tell us happened, right, roughly between 1940 and 1980. And then interestingly, between 1900 and around 1940 or 1950, we see another sort of great divergence that happened. And what, one of the things that's striking about this is that in the early part of the 20th century, there were many forces in the United States in terms of the, the sort of ongoing settlement and urbanization of the country that you might expect would push towards greater equalization rather than growing inequality. But in fact, that's not what we see. Um, <clears throat> moreover, another thing that, that I, I think I find striking about this picture is it runs against the, uh, the conventional wisdom around how the space economy of the United States has developed. And much of that comes from work at the state level, a key reference here would be Barrow and Salai Martin uh, in the early 1990s, who, uh, when examining states, showed that poorer states were catching up to richer ones, in, implying a decline in spatial inequality over that roughly 100-year period. Um, so these results suggest that when we sort of open up the overly large containers of states that, that hold within them very different kinds of local economies and get closer to the level of local labor markets as we're doing here, again, looking at commuting zones, uh, we see something really quite different. And, and these different facts demand thinking about, well, what is, what is behind this story? Now, <clears throat> um, we, we think that a big part of this story is has to do with what we're calling disruptive innovations, um, which Mega also referred to. Uh, and so behind this is an idea that we that comes from economic historians that says every once in a while we get a set of a cluster of big uh, sort of world shaking innovations that set off industrial revolutions. And when those, in, when those disruptive innovations occur, they create a, a host of new kinds of jobs, new forms of work, uh, new industries. And we might expect, initially at least, those new forms of work and those uh, new ideas to be produced in a limited number of places as people get together to try and share ideas that are quite hard to share at a distance. Um, and because there are big rewards to the development of these technologies, we might expect that spatial behavior to be associated with spatial inequality. And then we know, at least in the case of the second industrial revolution, uh, those technologies eventually matured, they spread out over space, and with that spreading out, one might expect to see the kinds of declines in spatial inequality that, uh, that I just showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and then that carries on until you get the next set of disruptive innovations that set off the next industrial revolution, where again, we would expect a rise in spatial inequality, right? So this is the sort of larger theory 
uh, that we are trying to explore as a possible answer to the, the puzzle of this sort of rising and falling and rising spatial inequality. <clears throat> One of the ways that we're trying to chase this down is by trying to identify the disruptive innovations themselves. And so here we are working with uh, detailed patent documents for the universe of patents in the, uh, in the US Patent and Trademark Office between 1920 and 2010. And the broad aim here is to identify within that universe of patents, those innovations that are most likely to be disruptive. And then because we can, because patents have inventor addresses and assignee addresses, uh, and of course dates, we can place these disruptive innovations in both space and time and see how they develop and compare them to innovations that are less likely to be disruptive. Now, I don't have time to get into the details, but later on in the question period, I'm happy to take questions about the methods here. Um, <clears throat> but so focusing on this, these most disruptive innovations, the, the picture on your left, uh, here, what we're doing is we're placing them in space and we're once again observing spatial concentration or deconcentration using Ginnies or tiles or coefficients of variation. Uh, and all of those tell the same story. And it's, I think, an interesting story. Uh, it says essentially that disruptive innovations are becoming increasingly spatially unequal between roughly 1920 and 1940. And then from around 1940 forward, they are spreading out across the United States. And then right around 1980, they start to reconcentrate again. And once again, we see the rise of spatial inequality. Now, one of the things that I think is striking about this is the obvious parallel with the income series. So this is very different data than income data, right? This is just about in, uh, inventions in space and time, but we see this very similar sort of pattern that strongly echoes the picture that we got from the income series of rising inequality and then declining and then rising again. Um, <clears throat> moreover, if we compare the most disruptive to the least disruptive, the least disruptive are more or less just spreading out over space over the 90 year study period. So there's something distinctive about these disruptive innovations that should focus our attention, not let's say just on technological activity or innovation in general, but on this subset of, uh, of inventive activity. Um, I also want to mention that this, this period of the 20s to 40s and the 80s and beyond conforms to stories that we get from economic historians about when key technologies associated with industrial revolutions start to really reshape the economy. So, of course, electromechanical stuff had been around long before 1920, uh, but it's widely agreed that it really hits the US economy in the 20s. And we could say the same thing for, let's say, semiconductors and computer technologies uh, from the 1980s. Another place we could look for evidence in support of these ideas is to the labor market. And again, not just thinking about skilled workers or workers with particular levels of educational attainment, but here what we want to do is try and focus on those workers who we think are most likely to be directly working with the big disruptive technologies of the moment. And so what we're trying to do is using microdata, identify a set of workers that belong to the, the sort of the cross section of certain kinds of occupations in certain kinds of industries, particular to each industrial revolution, and then observe their spatial behavior over time. So here we've got a, sort of an example graph from the second industrial revolution covering the 1900 to 1980 period. And so we wanna focus our attention here on the blue line that represents frontier workers in manufacturing. We're calling these workers at the front lines of technological adaptation, uh, frontier workers, right? Um, <clears throat> And what we can see is that these workers who are applying these disruptive technologies, extending them, putting them to work in the economy, have distinctive uh, spatial behavior. In other words, we can see that they are growing in terms of their spatial concentration between 1900 and 1940 or 1950. And then right around 1950, they start to spread out. And you can see that when we compare the spatial behavior of these workers to other kinds of workers, uh, these frontier workers seem to be behaving in space in very particular ways. And it goes without saying that these are also workers that we expect should earn unusually high wages, both from monopoly rents and from the, the scarce skills that they possess to work with and develop these disruptive technologies. So we can think of these as a kind of a vanguard for this, uh, this wider, phenomenon of, of uh, skill-biased agglomeration. 
And we can also see, and I don't want to get too bogged down in regression results, but when we put this in a more sort of multivariate context uh, and run models that are trying to predict economic performance of places, uh, what we see is that uh, that places that are engaged in disruptive innovation and disruptive innovation in general is linked to these patterns of spatial inequality. So broadly, we can see that they are important. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> I wanna spend a minute talking a little bit about policy with the expectation that we're gonna talk more about it um, in, in the discussion. Um, when we're thinking about how we might address spatial inequality in places like the United States, we can think of a couple of broad kinds of policy. One is to try and move workers to places where jobs are better. Uh, and another is to try and move better jobs to struggling places. Uh, of the first kinds of policies in the US, especially there is sort of a new consensus around how to do that. And, and that comes from loosening zoning requirements to make places like San Francisco uh, and New York cheaper. Uh, there'll be more affordable housing, so goes the thought. Um, and that's going to pull people from uh, more struggling places, perhaps a wider mix of skills. Uh, and among the potential effects of that, it is said, could be a decline in spatial inequality. Now, I think the work that I've been presenting suggests some problems with that. Um, in particular, a sort of a mismatch of skills. If these superstar cities are dense hubs of disruptive innovation that are uh, demand above all frontier workers, uh, then it suggests that there's little room in them. And I think we know this from some work by labor economists, there's little room in them for middle skilled jobs. Um, and so it, even by making it cheaper, which is a, a laudable goal and it's absolutely worth doing, it, it's unlikely to produce greater spatial equality. Um, <clears throat> moreover, even if it did pull workers from struggling places, it could easily result in a brain drain, leaving the left behind places even worse off. Uh, of course, the other thing we can do is try and make better jobs uh, happen in struggling places. Uh, and a lot of local economic development policy in the United States is focused on some of this goal and specifically attracting firms and industries to places and keeping them there once they're there. Uh, but one lesson from the work that I've presented is that these high value disruptive technologies are not likely to be very mobile when uh, they are at their most valuable, right? People are gathering together to share this uncodified, this tacit knowledge, um, and that makes them essentially immobile. Uh, and when they're mobile, they're worth less. Um, <clears throat> The second sort of policy intervention around of this kind might be of the kind of uh, industrial policy that's happening right now as part of um, Biden's planned uh, Amer American Rescue Plan and Build Back Better, um, <clears throat> where they're trying to seed essentially new disruptive innovations in a wider range of places. And I, I think this is a very good idea, but if you look at the budgets right now that are planned, and even those the, the uh, administration is struggling to get them approved, uh, are probably much too small to really make a dent in patterns of spatial inequality in the United States. Um, that doesn't mean I'm hopeless about what we can do to spread prosperity more widely. Um, I'm gonna leave this slide for later because I'm conscious of, of running out of time, but I think I'm hoping that we're gonna come back to it about what we might do to actually really try and make a dent and spread prosperity more widely. So thanks very much for listening. And I, I look forward to carrying on the conversation. Thank you so much, Tom. Now over to Simona. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am having problems with the Oops. the sharing. We can see your screen, Simona. You're fine. It's it's full screen. It's not full screen, but we can uh, see it. Well, sorry. I, I will I will try to 
because I know that this can happen and uh, I, I don't know why now I can't go on the full screen. Let me try again, sorry about that. Share screen. Share. For some reason, sorry. Simona, I think if you want to share the full screen, you have to do that before you share your screen. So if you want to make the PowerPoint bigger, stop sharing the screen, make it bigger. Right, right. No, no, it's it worked. It worked. We, we okay. Sorry, sorry about that. There we are. Sorry, and, and thank you very much for inviting well me. I'm, I'm privileged to be on this great panel. Thank you to the International Inequality Institute of the LSC, to the interpreters, to the chair. So it's it's very exciting, and so far I've really enjoyed this discussion. And uh, what I will provide is is another uh, uh, another insight into this technology and the territorial geographical inequality. Always using the example of the U.S. This is work uh, that is being carried out with the colleagues uh, uh, Marianne Feldman, Frederick Guy and Caroline Yuramashvili. So uh, uh, let's go back to uh, the theory very shortly, right? Increasing returns to place. Let's look at this agglomeration, big cities, tech cities, according to what economic geography theory has uh, uh, told us, right? Uh, putting at the center of uh, city growth, agglomeration economies, in particular localization economies, the benign Marshallian forces that we all know, or urbanization, so the, the scale and the diversity of cities, big cities that obviously spur innovation. On the other hand, the vision of closed economies is gone, long gone, and we have put these cities into the, let's say, the interaction between globalization process and technology that have allowed to, let's say, scale up and diffuse this uh, uh, external returns, these externalities uh, uh, to, to, through a global production networks, global value chains that are the linkages between this city. So uh, this is what we learn basically. So we learn that polarization of income and opportunity is actually uh, a geographical, has this distinct spatial uh, uh, um, aspect. Good jobs, uh, uh, headquarters of corporations, and you know, uh, high skill have clustered in certain places in certain cities and have left other places behind, I mean, just quoting the, 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 the famous work done by my colleague Andres Rodriguez Posse, Neil Lee, Michael Storpers, and Tom and others. So this is what we have. I wanted just to uh, go back to the same period that uh, Tom was referring about and look at the US top earners. This, this map shows the share of employed people earning more than the national 80th percentile, the change between 1980 and 2016. So the top 20 earners. And you can see that what happened is in this 40 years of time is that the highest concentration of well-paid job was once upon a time in the area of Chicago, the Midwest, Detroit, Gary, Indiana. And these are the places that have lost the most, right? Uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, where the old states hold, uh, uh, held, carried by Obama and then switched to Trump. Um, the other, uh, the other, the big winners, as you can see, are on the coast, in particular the area of, uh, 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 let's say, San Francisco, San Jose, Silicon Valley, and uh, some of the centers of, uh, let's say, political and financial power, uh, Washington DC, Boston, New York. 
and a few other that are in fact uh, like uh, North Carolina tri North Carolina Triangle, uh, Austin, California are all high tech, let's say, centers. Okay, so we see that spatial inequality has in fact grown and in the US, but uh, as well in Europe and elsewhere, also in emerging economies. And what do you do? As Tom was saying, exactly the same, in, when you have these agglomeration economies increasing returns to place, you move to the big tech city if you are a worker, or you make your place better with, uh, with this has been the case, particularly in the European Union with this uh, place-based policies, bottom-up approaches, a smart specialization, reform of local institutions, investing in innovation, in human capital, in entrepreneurship, attract foreign firms, promote high tech digital startup, and this is a story that I will continue in a couple of slides. Actually, I have to say that looking at this, promote, move to the big tech city. I mean, if you are a worker, we have forgotten that also uh, digital startup are very mobile and you know are attracted by the big city. This is a tale precisely that I will tell uh, uh, shortly. What this plan and this uh, policy approach rests upon is a distinct uh, a theoretical assumption that tells us that we are moving in a classically in perfectly competitive environment market of firms of perfect competition. Now, um, this is, however, not the case in the sense that the new technologies and uh, uh, the, the latest technologies over really the last 20 uh, years have been associated to specific business structures, okay? We have seen a rising information-based network industries and business models, a platform monopoly strategies. And so when you get to monopoly, increasing returns are not external to the firms benefiting all of them, but are actually internal to the firms. So we can think about what do I mean by, by, by digital platform? Well, is a type of network uh, uh, business model. Platforms are business models that are based on uh, a linking two sides of the transaction parties like think about amazon with uh, with uh, their marketplace or facebook among friends closely related are other business models that are based on proprietary general post-post software such as microsoft okay or anyway even in other sectors that are strong uh, strong ipr based such as pharmaceutical such as biotech think about monsanto with uh, with uh, with the monopoly on seeds so these are all information based network industries and what happens is that the interaction between this platform externalities uh, 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 and agglomeration economies, I mean, interact and the returns are internal to firms. All this is amplified by financialization of capital markets for firms. So the bigger and bigger role of uh, fi finance in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in financializing uh, the way the firms uh, get capitals on the market and institutional changes that in the US specifically have been uh, uh, since Reagan in 1980. In fact, the Chicago School Bork uh, uh, interpretation of uh, 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 of competition that and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, requires evidence that then could then that consumers are, uh, uh, you know, are interests have been somehow uh, uh, um, somehow uh, uh, disrupted, and only in that case you will have antitrust regulation coming in. This meant, in fact, in the U.S., that uh, this this antitrust cases dried up in that since that period, expanded and stronger and stronger IPR. So, just to give you, I mean, uh, uh, an impression, this is marked up as shown by the excellent work of Eggiston and others. 
uh, it has to be said that nowadays there is a lot of uh, different interpretation or, or, or criticism on how to measure markups because markups nowadays is not only the, the or monopoly is not only measured by markup because we have uh, we have uh, also a winners a winners takes all uh, kind of interpretation of monopoly. So what we did actually was precisely to use a very simple uh, sort of tobing cue, so a measure of monopoly that rests on the ratio of market value or market capitalization, so what the company is basically worth on the stock market, okay? So that's why you see all this gray area in between, because these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, local labor market, but uh, they have to have listed firms, so most uh, of these do not have. And uh, uh, you, 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 the ratio is market value on book uh, value as of assets. So on company accounts, what the company or materials, tangible, intangible assets that the firm owns. And so the bigger the difference in this ratio, obviously, uh, the higher the, the, the entry barrier and therefore the higher the monopoly. So it's a measure of monopoly is simple. And you can see that by calculating this at the level of uh, uh, um, a market, uh, a local market, you can see that it is increasing, uh, 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 especially in the same location on, on the two coast and uh, 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 large rises in this tech cities in the west coast and northeast and declines in much more uh, 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 X, uh, uh, let's say, manufacturing, uh, uh, I mean, the center of the second revolution. So, uh, um, the market, uh, so the monopoly power exists, has increased. And, uh, you know, the, the, what we claim here is going back to the digital startups, right? That has been one of the uh, policy tool used to revamp local economic development. The problem is that these digital startups that are element in these policies are, uh, uh, you know, in principle, very mobile. They have low fixed capital requirement, high skills, but that are universally taught because the number of university uh, uh, around across the US that teaches, uh, uh, teach these skills is, is actually very widespread. They have weightless products, they are digital, so apparently footloose, they rely only on, you know, a good, a good uh, uh, infrastructure in terms of electricity electricity and internet connections, right? So um, founders would prefer, and there is a ample literature on that, to keep the firm where it was first established as also policymakers that provide incentive and financial support for startups. However, what we see is an ecology of the big tech cities and hubs that attract skilled labors, venture capital, so the finance, and therefore the, the you have you have all these digital startups that start look for venture capital financing, with the aim of being sold because this is the main aim of digital startups either through uh, 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 in, uh, um, initial public offer, uh, um, offer that is rather rare or through acquisition. And what we see, in fact, is that precisely with the aim of being acquired, particularly if you have a global large tech firm, you migrate on the, on the tech, in the tech cities. What we found by looking in particular at this example of how monopoly rents, in fact, disrupt local uh, policies, local economic development policies elsewhere in the places that do not have the same kind of uh, uh, rent, monopoly rent, we find that firms acquired by the big tech are disproportionately to the sector in which they operate, so to the all other firms, concentrated particularly in this ma major tech cities and hubs. So uh, uh, we focused in particular, and this is a precise second work that look more at the example of this monopoly story. We focus on this uh, big tech acquisition, uh, doing a, a comparative analysis. So uh, we selected on criteria that are 
explained uh, uh, seven big tech in uh, based in Silicon Valley five, Google, Adobe, Apple, uh, Facebook, and Oracle. Uh, Facebook is now changing name, Meta, but I mean, it's rather controversial at the moment. And so Seattle with Amazon and Microsoft. And we look at the startups, right? Uh, uh, taken over by big tech in the period 1997, 2020. Okay, because before they weren't there, basically. And we compare their location with the location of four comparator groups in the last 20 years, 21, 2020, in order to have really, I mean, a consistent sample. Okay, we use multiple data sources from Bureau Van Dijk, SP, Capital IQ, SDC, Platinum is a combination in order to track all of this. And uh, what we see is in fact, I mean, we focus on three sectors. This is important to know because more than three quarters of all the acquisition of the big tech here considered is in three uh, uh, NASIC codes, okay? Is computer programming services, uh, pre-packed software and computer processing and data preparation processing services. And we compared with all the other US non-big tech acquisition in the same sectors, other businesses invested in by, by, um, um, by venture capitalists who sold firms to the tech giants, which is a subsample of the first uh, uh, comparator, comparator. Companies in this sector that made an IPO stock or, and companies in those sectors receiving, uh, uh, receiving the small business uh, administration loans, that is a, a tool at the federal level that helps precisely small startups. So what you see here is the geography of targets. You can see that the location of uh, this uh, big tech acquisition targets is highly concentrated in actually the Silicon Valley story, right? And the other, uh, let's say second tier groups are in New York uh, uh, Finance uh, Center, uh, Boston, and uh, you know the same uh, Seattle and Los Angeles. If you look at also, we looked, but excluded from the analysis, but the geography of the acquisition of the big tech outside the US, it is interesting to see how uh, uh, you know these uh, are also very, very geographically, especially concentrated at the national level. Look at the United Kingdom with 50 big tech acquisition in the period. Uh, 43 of which in London or Tel Aviv, 20 out of 32. So, I mean, it's it's uh, it's interesting to look at this and we, we, it probably will be a further research line. So uh, this is just to show you these are uh, this is a map. We have each map for different the, the different four comparator groups. Right. And you can see here that uh, um, you can see that uh, uh, these are the big tech acquisitions relative to all uh, the US acquisition in the three sectors that you can see at the bottom of the slide. So uh, the size of this circle uh, uh, gives us the number of firms in the comparison group. OK, so all other acquisition, while the shade, the intensity of the color, with the intensity of the color tells us the number of big tech acquisition relative to the, the, the old acquisition. And you can see in fact, where the location of these acquisition are. And I mean, precisely looking at the initial geography of this, uh, 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 startups, you see that uh, uh, the big tech hub or the big financial hubs a little bit less, I mean, attract digital startup, I mean, basically stripping assets from other places that are, uh, that they don't have this interaction between agglomeration economies, externalities and internal uh, return to scale uh, to the firm. So the conclusion of all this is, is, is is that traditional economic geography theory that tells us that these tech hub, tech cluster cities are attractive for pure productivity spillover, knowledge spillovers and productivity reasons. We actually claim that much of productivity in tech city is due to monopoly rents. And uh, uh, there is a number, uh, 
a number also of studies that look at monopoly, not from a geographical perspective, that support the idea that actually monopolies uh, in these uh, clusters are harming innovation, are hampering innovation from competition. So pure spatial explanation need really to go back to market structure, which is actually a rather important economic construct in economic theory and has been disregarded always on the basis of assumption of perfect competition. And we see that spatial pluralization of income opportunity and also the failure of, uh, you know, frequent failure of local economic development policies need really to think about, you know, regulation which directly attack and dismantle the exclusivity of platform, okay? Uh, from uh, uh, open standard control of data ownership and accessibility and monopoly. I mean, just let's think about the Facebook absorption of WhatsApp or Instagram were completely uh, unchallenged. Some signs are there, but I mean, uh, are still very weak and therefore there is still reason for, uh, for uh, uh, worrying uh, about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simona. Um, just to remind you, uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to write down your questions. Um, we've already had some questions come in for the speakers, so I'm going to start actually in the order of presentations. Um, and I'm going to group some of the questions together. So to begin with um, questions from Mega, there was uh, one from Jose Luis Viveros from, Viveros from the ILO. No, sorry, this is for Tom, sorry. Um, from Judith Allen, um, why aren't we even mentioning redistribution of income through welfare st state type interventions? That was one question for Mega. And then uh, the other was, um, also for Mega, which policies are being looked at to tackle developing countries exploiting white collar workers? Um, and just to add to this, Mega, the, I know there was a question before on the data availability, which you seem to have answered privately, but perhaps that's also of interest to the other listeners. So let's start with that and um, then we'll move on. Okay, great, super. Um, thanks so much, Kirsten. And um, Tom and Simona, I really enjoyed your presentation. So thanks a lot for that too. Um, so let me start maybe with Judith's question, um, which I thought was a really interesting question about why we don't use more um, welfare state type interventions. And so sort of qu two quick comments on that. Um, one is that, uh, you know, transversal programs of the welfare state type um, uh, are usually really good at redistributing opportunities across people uh, and governments, uh, well, specifically at least high or medium capability governments are quite good at targeting poor and vulnerable people uh, across space. I think what they're not very good at doing is, um, is doing the same for poor or vulnerable places. And, and that's where I think a lot of the conversation was about whether the impact, uh, you know, what is the impact of that policy over time? And, um, uh, you know, we know that governments are usually not very good at picking winners, including technological winners uh, when, it's, when it comes to firms, uh, but also when it comes to creating clusters, uh, technology clusters or any other clusters for that matter. Uh, these tend to grow much more organically in a particular place because firms tend to draw upon talent that's around them and uh, you know, startups tend to spin off across the established enterprises or the skill that's there. So I, I guess the answer is, you know, what governments can do when you're not thinking about poor people, where I think the welfare programs work really well, but you're thinking about places and not people. And there, government policy could help. And I'm going to just speak from the technology part, because that's what we're talking about. Otherwise, it's just too broad a question to respond to. Um, you know, you could have liberal policies, for instance, that could award employment permits to skilled workers. Uh, I think you had examples in Israel with tech visas and other countries have done that. You could have government procurement contracts that can help to create opportunities for local companies uh, that could flourish, flourish, which would, you know, without infringing upon, um, I don't know, commitments to free trade, for instance, or they could unbundle large projects into smaller components, especially for ICT. So, you know, just a quick response to that, that really excellent question. Um, 
the question on the data uh, and the availability of some of the data that I referred to, it really depends. It's it's uh, So a lot of the data that we do have is publicly available, and there's a unit within the World Bank called GHOST, um, the Geospatial Operations Support Team, uh, and um, they make all of that data available in a central repository. However, there is um, data which is, uh, you know, is, is kept confidential. So for instance, the data from Slum Dwellers International is a confidential data set because it, um, there are privacy concerns concerns about the location of the slum dwellers themselves and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and of course, data that's shared uh, directly by the clients is not something that we can make available. However, we do work with a lot of researchers and, and we take on these cases. Um, you know, we have a case by case approach to specific data sets. Um, Adam, your question is also a really good question. Uh, I'm afraid in my professional capacity, because we don't really work directly with developed country clients. All of our clients at the World Bank are developing country clients. Um, I, I'm not sure that I'm best placed to respond to it. We do work a lot in... <clears throat> the European Union and Central Asia. So we do have sort of middle and high middle income cities uh, and some countries that are our clients and they do grapple with these questions. And um, we find that a lot of the jobs or, uh, you know, the inequality in those countries is really within countries. So it's looking at low skill versus high skilled workers within the countries as opposed to uh, thinking about, uh, you know, skill distribution across um, different countries. But it's a really good question as well. Um, it's just that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, most of the, the countries that we work with are developing countries. So I would love for someone else on the panel to maybe take up Adam's question and see what they have to say about it. Um, thanks so much. Okay, there are indeed some questions in the uh, Q&A for everybody, but I'm going to pass, uh, go, go over to Tom first now with the questions that were specifically for him. Um, one is... I guess for Tom, also from um, Stefan Wirtz. Oh, hang on. Sorry, my screen is jumping as I'm talking, so I'm losing the questions. Um, Stefan Wirtz, how would but why would Boeing Corporation move production to Charlotte and not the HQ to Chicago? Is it, is it non-unionized labor tax, or is it also by exploring the former labor marbles like Chicago, Detroit, etc.? Um, I hope you can read that question uh, to perhaps better interpret it. Um, then another question for, for Tom was from Ying Wang, um, asking about the disruptiveness of technologies, uh, which also have a spatial character rather than being aspatial. Um, for instance, when the most disruptive technologies become increasingly codified and enter the stage of massive diffusion in advanced economies, would it still be disruptive in emerging, eco emerging economies? And if so, how would we quantify this? And his second question is uh, going a bit further, would the same patents be classified simultaneously into tacit and codified categories? Um, I think you can uh, read that question yourself there. And um, one last one from Jose Luis Viveros. Um, what is the role of the business environment and government as in, an investor of first resort to move better jobs into struggling places? And what are the main barriers in the context of the US? Tom, over to you. Thanks, Kirsten. Those are it's big all questions. the easy questions, Tom. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, actually, before answering any of those questions, I wanted to weigh in a little bit about the question that Mega got about welfare, because I actually think it's really important. In some ways, the you know, the, the framing of today's, or at least part of the framing of today's session was about uh, sort of, are we able to include uh, lower income people or less skilled individuals in the, in the tech economy sort of as a means of prosperity? But actually, I, I think I'm, I'm less interested that everybody should be involved in, in tech and more interested in thinking about the opportunities that and challenges that tech affords us to deal with gaps in prosperity. And so I think in that regard, welfare policies come in in a really big way. Um, so you can think of, I mean, it's, it's unclear right now how much of Biden's agenda is actually going to get through, but there are lots of ways in which we can think about Biden's Build Back Better agenda as a sort of a reinvention of the welfare state or reinvigoration at least of the welfare state in the United States. Um, and I think some of those policies could go quite far towards um, softening at least spatial inequality. So dealing with poverty, which we know is uh, spatially structured, the policies themselves don't need to be spatially structured if poverty is spatially structured, right? And so by, by 
addressing poverty better than we have been, uh, part of that is going to be a decline in the uh, sort of the concentrations of poverty in uh, poverty in place. So I think there's actually a, a you know a very big role for uh, for welfare policy here in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, <clears throat> I, so turning to the question about Boeing, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I don't. I don't know anything about the Boeing case, um, so I'm not particularly well placed um, to answer it. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna turn to other questions. Um, there was a question about the the role of the government as an investor. Uh, so I'm reading here as investor of the first resort to move better jobs to struggling places. Uh, so in the United States case, at least. Um, there is something called the Economic Development Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce. And uh, I mean, its role is to, at least in part, to try and, and accomplish that goal. Um, but, and I sort of hinted at this in the, the policy slide that I had, um, the, you know, the budgets of the EDA have been slashed very steadily over the past number of decades. So it has a lot less money to play with to try and do that. And, and again, although there is, um, Part again, part of you know Biden's agenda to reinvigorate that somewhat. Um, from my perspective, at least, the the money being talked about is still very very small. If we were to try and be serious about that, so Elizabeth Warren, for instance, is really keen on the idea that we uh, disperse uh, federal research and development money, sort of explicitly thinking about geography, trying to seed R&D labs in a wider array of places. Um, but doing that requires real money, right? Whether we're doing it with federal labs or trying to seed nascent clusters, which Mega talked about, it's, it, I agree, a very difficult task. Uh, but at the very least, it requires a real commitment by the federal government to spend money and make it happen. Now, you know, there, there's questions of misallocation when it comes to that and problems of picking winners and so on. But I do think we've learned a fair bit since the 1960s about policy tools that we might use to at least limit that. And I, you know, I sort of see the government, a potential role for the government as a kind of a public venture capital in a way that might spur uh, a, wide, a geographical widening of prosperity. So, I mean, the answer is for me, absolutely. I see, I see a role for the government doing that. And I think the government does too. Whether they can pull it off at the scale that they need is another question. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there was an interesting question actually about, about tacit knowledge, which I'm glad somebody asked about. So I sort of hinted about the fact that in the background um, of these disruptive innovations, that the reason why um, frontier workers, inventors, and so on are clustered in space is to share tacit knowledge. And, and I hear, I, I take Simona's point quite well about market structure and the need for us to think about that. In other words, the need for us not to be too naive about the forces that are pulling people together in space, uh, because I do think market structure, you know, does have a role there. But I also think tacit knowledge, I don't think it's an either or. Um, uh, and I do think tacit knowledge is an, a really important pe uh, reason why uh, these sort of people clustered around the act of disruptive innovation are uh, are pulled together in space. Um, and actually we're doing work, I didn't, I mean, 10 to 15 minutes isn't tons of time to say everything that you're doing, but some some of the ongoing work that, that I'm doing together with Michael Scorper and Sergio Petralia is to dig into the patent data to actually build measures of the tacitness of patents uh, and to trace their geography. And uh, I mean, what we see when we do that is a, a pretty amazing picture in the sense that at least between 1940 and 2010, the geography of tacit new ideas uh, follows the same sort of patterns that I showed in the income series and then in the disruptiveness series, meaning that while spatial inequality is rising, um, so is the concentration of tacit knowledge in space. And when spatial inequality is declining, uh, the tacitness of knowledge is spreading out. Um, so um, yeah, some, someday there will be a paper about that. Um, so thanks for the question. Thanks, Tom. Now over to Simona. Um, one question actually that just came in recently. Uh, do you have insights on which concept may bring more analytical disadvantages to analyze technologies 
impact on economic geography, industrial revo revolutions, or the pair, techno-economic waves, techno-economic paradigms? Um, that's one question to, to Tom and Simona, but we'll start with Simona. And um, another one from Dimitri um, asking about the putting the logic of or putting the logic on um, the onus of, on spatial inequalities uh, to techn technological disruption at a moment when the EU is struggling to create a fully functioning digital single market. Shouldn't we focus more on the efficiency of policies like EU smart specialization and revitalization of our urban spaces through new technologies? And what are the credible alternatives? That's one other question. And then, um, Earlier on, there was a question from Yorga, which I'm looking for now. Yes. Um, please explain further how we can regulate the monopoly of big tech companies. It happens not only in the US, but also in a developing country. And indeed, they harm innovation and competition, exacerbating spatial inequality. Simona. Right. I mean, all big questions. And I agree with Miga and Tom that here we should be allowed to have a couple of days of discussion. I mean, the concepts, uh, uh, I mean, technology uh, uh, seen in, uh, in a inequality way is structural, okay? Innovation and technology process, as we have learned from the, the work that I consider really foundational in this respect, which comes from Schumpeter onwards, but has been settled down by the two American economists that, uh, um, uh, um, that uh, you know, wrote the, the foundation of economics uh, 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 and uh, evolutionary change, uh, you know, it, it is that technology works in the direction of agglomeration and dispersion in the sense that innovation creates winner and loser anyway in 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 particularly when we talk about disruption technologies okay so uh, uh, nelson and winters have told us that this is absolutely a character of innovation that cannot be avoided so the problem here now in this world both for emerging economies where uh, obviously disparities are, are 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 very evident and for the advanced world where uh, it is becoming more and more problematic because we haven't talked about you know what are the characters of these cities i mean san francisco and what monopolies have been doing to san francisco i mean is is probably one of the most iconic example in the world because in the last few years san francisco itself has transformed in a hub of tech, uh, young people that earn, uh, uh, you know, uh, money that is absolutely non-justifiable in a way, but at the same time pushing out of houses people that were not poor originally and have become, and now actually I'm, I'm very sorry to to, to, to say that there are shanty towns also in San Francisco center. So these are these are phenomena that are growing and uh, in Europe probably less evident, but we see people increasingly living in parks right here in London. So uh, uh, this is something that uh, technology and innovation processes are uh, the, the, the creation. So in a way going towards Tom, disruptive technologies is necessarily concentrated diffusion helps to re to, to, to break, bring down disparities because is precisely going percolating through the society and so we have to focus on to diffuse and uh, because creation i mean the, the 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 you know making making creation more uh, uh, diffuse across space is something that can be done, but it is much more more complicated. Now, uh, um, focusing on digital efficiency, yes, I know the EU is struggling because it's always been behind the US and maybe other Asian countries in implementing digital, digital market that are unified. But on the other hand, 
I mean, I am a bit worried always when we focus too much on efficiency because this is what we have been doing in Europe in the last 30 years. Efficiency has always been there, equity much less. The social agenda of the EU disappeared in the early 90s, right after the completion of the internal market. And more than efficiency, I would uh, you know, shift the focus precisely on how to restore equity and social agenda, which means necessarily to go to regulation, regulation and breaking up the power of, I, I was talking about seven big tech, which is a very small sample and example, right? Because in pharma, in chemistry, in many other industry, this is very prominent. These are all network uh, companies and uh, um, models that are, however, based on enforcement of, uh, of property rights. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, monopoly, monopoly, uh, uh, somehow uh, um, regulation has to become part of the story because otherwise we do not have a, a, a state approach that is balanced. So I mean, with my our little story, we 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 showed that you know you can put money and efforts in stimulating small firms that have potentially a future, but then that. I mean, that investment goes somewhere else, doesn't stay local, okay? And the problem with regulating monopoly, and you know, I was, I was just mentioning that there are ways to do that. There are ways to, uh, uh, you know, attack this exclusive rents of the platform, whatever platform, starting from regulation that prevents Microsoft to be, uh, uh, to appropriate, uh, you know, parts of the network that are actually based on open software, for example, many of these can be, but the, the, the most difficult thing here is that these monopolies are global. Even in the case of small firms, let's take another sector services like Airbnb or uh, TripAdvisor. These are small companies that extract rents from all over the world. There are millions of small renters all over the place that give up to 25% of their income to an Airbnb that doesn't do more than connect on a platform okay so you can see that the problem is not regulation national but is regulation supranational and here is where i i you know i, I don't have actually a, a, a real solution because the solution is obviously political thank you so much simona um there are quite a few questions in the q a that go to all of the speakers, but I'm actually going to start with two questions that came up on Facebook. So one from Kuala Lumpur, what's the best interventionism and policies framing, policy framing of the digital economy acceleration and stimulus in general, particularly in emerging markets such as in Asia and Malaysia? Um, that one to all of you. And um, I think uh, Mega was also interested in answering the questions from S2 in the um, chat and from Diana Gutierrez uh, Posada, one about uh, political organizations that can be put together to face the spatial inequality. And the second question, um, what comes first in terms of trying to reduce inequality? You can all see the question, so I'll leave you to read the details yourselves in the interests of time. And also perhaps the other speakers, if they would like to intervene um, in some of the remaining questions, there are still questions coming in. So if you see anything that um, you would like to respond to, then just um, please grab the microphone. Over to Mega. Okay, thanks. Uh, no, I wasn't sure if, if you were handing over to me. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, so so I, I think there are three questions um, that kind of similar. So one is from Diana from Spain, S2 from Indonesia, and then um, Stefan, um, I think. Anyway, so Diana, a really interesting question, you know, what comes first, um, investments in industrial structures or investments in, uh, uh, you know, good infrastructure or skills? Uh, from my part, I think the response would be investing in transversal infrastructure, whether it's physical, um, socioeconomic, uh, would probably be a better bet, especially in places where resources are scarce and institutional capabilities are low. Um, and so, you know, I think that would be uh, the best bet that, especially from the point of view of government, can make. Um, S2 had a question about um, whether the digital space uh, 
uh, sort of exacerbates inequalities or expands uh, uh, you know, opportunities. And I, I think it's a two part answer, which is that the digital space obviously expands the total space that's available for communities and people to be involved. But like any other space, it can replicate existing inequalities, exacerbate inequalities or reduce them. Or the outcomes are just going to depend on you know, what institutions or exist or what policy makers and those institutions are really pushing for. So uh, it, it's a contextual um, response I think. Um, and then Stefan had a very interesting question, which I think we grapple with all the time, which is what can you do, how businesses can more effectively invest in poorer cities or neglected communities. Um, and, you know, I, I live in South Africa, and this is a, a, a huge question is, how do you bring in private investment or private enterprises to townships or, you know, neglected communities in, in South Africa? And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not, I think there's been a lot of funding, uh, not just here, but in, in many countries to try and attract firms through, I don't know, tax incentives or other regulatory schemes to, to, to particular neighborhoods or, or places. Um, and uh, the, you know, as I said earlier, I think the, the learnings from that is that it's, um, it's not very clear if that's going to work, but, you know, investing again in transversal infrastructure, again, uh, usually does make places uh, attractive over time. I would like to add, and I know this is being recorded, so I should be careful, but, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, if you think about places that are not just poor and neglected, but are going to be vulnerable because, I don't know, they're going to be coastal cities and they're going to be affected by heat island effects or flooding or drought effects effects over time, uh, it's going to be a very similar debate about do you invest in, in strengthening resilience in those places over time, or are you going to invest in strengthening the resilience of people, and they might choose whether they want to stay in places that are going to become increasingly vulnerable over time physically or socioeconomically, uh, and then they might choose to migrate away, away from those places or have other, um, you know, other ways of adapting to changes over time. Thank you. Thank you, Mega. Um, Tom, Simona, either of you particularly would, would like to go first to answer some of the other questions? Yeah, so I mean, I, I want to echo a bit of what Mega said, which is, of course, whether you're thinking, obviously, that, you know, the US case or the UK, there are particularities that make me hesitant to translate to just about anywhere. Um, but I do think that there is there's clearly a, a running tension between investing in people and investing in places. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a challenge in the United States as well. In the US case, the, the emphasis has been traditionally at least much more to, em to emphasize people with the idea that uh, internal migration is going to sort it out. So, you know, people are going to move to where the opportunities are if we equip them with you know, sufficient human capital and, and other sorts of sort of people oriented assets, then the rest is going to take care of itself. Um, I think there's an increasing consensus that that's not sufficient, especially since Americans are moving around a lot less than they used to. Uh, so the sort of the, the mechanism through which investing in people turned into, you know, you know places being okay is, is somewhat broken, which is I think part of why we have spatial inequality. But I, I think that that tension is really running through uh, through all of it. And so I, I do think you need to think about place and not just people. Uh, but of course, you can't, you can't ignore one or the other. You need to be, I think, pushing on both. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Simona, is there yeah. anything you'd like to add? You just muted yourself, Simona. Sorry, uh, there is something going on. I mean, my, my screen is, is, is moving Some, somehow. Probably you have the same problem. I, I, I don't have full control of the screen any longer. However, um, I agree with Tom, I was saying, and uh, people are in places, okay? So uh, uh, um, I, I tend to look at places because it is somehow a unit of analysis that in policy, in public policy and intervention is much easier to tackle. I mean, uh, in a way, uh, uh, going across, uh, you know, units of analysis that are too dispersed creates much more uh, problems. So places and activity. It is. And this, this uh, is something that uh, um, the, the problem that I see is, is because, you know, uh, we have seen all this place-based 
um, intervention coming out uh, first uh, quite shyly and in the last very few years as uh, as particularly uh, in the in the after, aftermath of the financial economic crisis in 2008 uh, in the last five six years this place based has in fact taken a, 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 a very substantial uh, right uh, um, kind of direction looking not only at economic activities but also at the intersection between different cultures and institutions, which I think is still something that uh, somehow is not applied uh, so much in uh, 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 you know emerging and developing economies. We still think and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, about uh, uh, the African continent as uh, something rather homogeneous, and you see this kind of rhetoric coming out uh, 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 quite frequently, which is worrying because even as 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 we see in Europe, right, uh, even a city and a village or within region disparity or within cities disparities are taking the stage so uh, on this on this i am uh, you know convinced that looking at the particularities of places uh, is an important step towards uh, trying to understand which kind of activities can in fact spur uh, uh, well-being and development overall. On the other hand, we are all connected through global linkages and how, in fact, to uh, uh, to implement uh, control on this local, uh, uh, on this global network is much more complicated because, just to give you the last examples, of course, all these big tech right google uh, 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 facebook but also monsanto are in the end export uh, uh, export industries for the united states of america and therefore i doubt that the us will obviously in their own interest as as an average uh, you know implement very strong uh, uh, intervention against uh, the, the, the their own source of richness so uh, is something that requires for sure much more thinking, much more uh, 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 political uh, uh, kind of alignment on the big issues that are in fact, I mean, you know, emerging disparities, growing disparities, but also alienation, uh, marginalization of entire community, both in emerging, in developing and uh, 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 advanced economies. Thank you, Simona. One final question, I think, which also goes out to everyone. Um, I'm not sure whether the speakers want to pick who answers it, but there's a question from Martin Ojeda in Spain. How important is the confidence among players in institutions in order to spread prosperity as an outcome of technological change? I think that's an important question in a context today where we've had so many social protests emerge in different parts of the world. Um, maybe one of the speakers wants to pick up that question just as a final answer any takers <laughs> i mean is simona trying to unmute because if she is then i'm going to take a step back well, her video is off at the moment, so why don't you have a shot and Simona can add a comment if she wants to. Okay, uh, well, actually, it's not it's not a very good answer. It's, it's a very good question. I mean, obviously, if I was just going to be picky, I was going to say it's very important because that's the question. I guess the question is, how do you actually instill that confidence? So, so clearly, as you can see in a lot of countries, if you don't have um, trust uh, in you know, institutions and, and communities, then uh, yeah, you can see that, uh, you know, you can see breakdown of a lot of institutional mores that have built up over time. So the, 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 the answer to the question is it's very important. I guess the question that you're really asking is how do you, you build up that confidence or, or, you know, invest in those institutional mores over time? And for that answer, um, I will turn to our esteemed colleagues, Simona and Tom, to take a shot at that one, because that's a, a very, very difficult question to respond to, but a very good one. Thanks. Any final comments? 
Yeah, if I may, I mean, the, pro the problem that we have and I see at the moment is that all the social actors and the pact, the social pact, should be rethought because, uh, you know, when you when you bring together the various stakeholders, we need also to think about the consequences of the last, you know, 30, 40 years of, uh, uh, um, you know, kind of disruption of social capital, okay? One important, for example, just, just because it's prominent also, uh, 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 in some, you, you know, university contest in the UK is the role at the nature, the the the, the real configuration of trade unions, that we we, we still stick to uh, uh, old concepts that are not there any longer, and what these trade unions have become in different places across who is going to, uh, you know, to take responsibility for the workers or uh, to represent them because obviously uh, the, the, the individualization of work and industrial relation is something important that has occurred and who is representing? I mean, uh, uh, you know, towards Amazon or towards Google or towards, I mean, there are, there are many low skilled workers that are employed as we know in the United States by Amazon, who is going uh, uh, to represent them is very unclear. And this is causing also a lot of dispossession, a lot of, uh, you know, infringement even of, you know, worker human rights. So uh, a lot of social capital categories should be probably rethought. And uh, this is my feeling at least. Thank you, Tom, any final comments? Yeah, I mean, when I hear that question, one of the things, it, it, it's, very, it's very stimulating, obviously, and there's a lot of different ways that we could answer it. But what, one thing that occurs to me is that in some ways, it's a question about electoral politics. Uh, and, you know, we've had decades in countries like the, in, like the US and the UK, at least, where governments have uh, sort of been actively undermining their role as, as agents that make uh, that that address poverty, that address people who are struggling and make their lives better. Um, and so it, in some ways, it's not surprising that we're sort of in, in a spiral where voters are uh, unclear about how to vote uh, in, in their best interest at times. And so I think if we are going to address these kinds of policies, uh, it does require confidence. It requires confidence in a political system that can actually uh, produce electoral outcomes that can lead to government making people's lives better. We need to sort of reverse that spiral. Um, that, that's what that's what I would say. OK, thank you so much. We're running out of time, so I'm going to apologize to all anyone who may have had questions that weren't answered. But thank you all so much for the wonderful pres presentations to the panelists and thank you all for attending. Um, so I'm going to close this event now. And just as a reminder, please see us again on Monday at the next III event um, at 1 p.m. about um, taxation, history, theory, law and administration. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you for the wonderful presentations and thank you for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, thank Kirsten. You. you were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye-bye.